Welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak. This week, I sit down with one of the guys from the Spitballers Comedy Podcast. He's the producer, Jeremy Grantham. He and I talk about his interesting story in just a moment. You know, every week for a month now, the good folks at American Pride Roasters Coffee have been warning you, tax season is upon us, and we're now in the home stretch. So if you haven't done your taxes yet, you may be in for a few late nights, and what better way to stay awake doing those taxes to make sure the government gets even more money from you this year than by having a warm cup of APR coffee alongside. This month's blend is focused on the nation's first Treasury Secretary, and in fact, it's a big topic of conversation in this week's At the Mic with Jeremy Grantham. I'm talking about Alexander Hamilton, who lost his life in a famous duel with Aaron Burr back in 1804. The Burr-Hamilton blend from the history-minded team at APR Coffee is made of fresh Central and South American coffee beans blended perfectly with blueberry and donut flavors that make this the perfect breakfast brew, a dessert coffee, or even the perfect companion for those late nights doing your taxes. Head over to aprcoffee.com. Be sure to use offer code ATM, that stands for at the mic, when you get ready to check out, and they're going to send you a free 8-ounce bag of the Reagan A Time for Choosing blend. That's a $10 value, and it's yours for free when you order at least two pounds of coffee from them. That's aprcoffee.com, offer code ATM at checkout. You're listening to At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Jeremy Grantham, also known by listeners of the Spitballers comedy podcast as Owl Borland. He's this week's guest on At The Mic. And today, Jeremy is going to tell us about the route he took in joining the Spitballers in the Fantasy Footballers podcast team. He shares a very embarrassing story from his days in fifth grade and has one of those unforgettable stories about Bitcoin and what could have been. Without further delay, let's get the conversation started with this week's guest on At The Mic, it's Jeremy Grantham. This is such a treat for me because he's the executive producer of the Spitballers Comedy Podcast. So when you're not listening to At The Mic, I would encourage you to check out the Spitballers Podcast because the guys over there, the entire team, just a fun crew and... um, Jeremy being uh, the, I'm going to call you the captain of the ship. Maybe the guys won't appreciate that, but I appreciate you making time today, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. So you guys are based in Phoenix, Arizona, and that's where you grew up, correct? Yep. Born and raised. So my mom used to live in the Phoenix metro area. And one of the things that I would always see there is Camelback Mountain. And so my wife and I decided, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so when we were visiting there, we decided we're going to try to hike up this thing. We have some time to kill. We didn't have the kids with us because that's the key. If you ever want to do something, you know, <laughs> off the beaten path and make some time. Have you ever tried to climb Camelback Mountain, Jeremy, in all of your time living there? I have. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up because, um, again, prior to, to me having kids, uh, I used to hike that mountain all the time. Uh, wow. And we, a buddy of mine, we would uh, we'd hike up the front side, uh, down the back side, and then back up the back side and back down the front side where we started. Um, oh, so essentially, we'd no. we'd hike it tw- twice in a row. It it's a Are tough you mountain, me? but uh, no kidding. No. So uh, when when my wife and I attempted this, we probably got it's okay for those that aren't familiar. It is a beast. It it, it is it is. I am fascinated that you not only did it once, but twice, because you're a show-off, obviously. But you you get about, you know, they got the little signs along the way, and it shows you the uh, incline and how far along you are. And maybe we were yep. one-sixteenth of the way up, uh, maybe an eighth of the way, I don't even know. You, first of all, you, you look at the sign, and you say, no way am I only one eighth of the way up this beast and and the inclines uh that they have on the sign it's just it's so intense and then you start looking at the faces of the people coming down and they look like they've just seen a ghost or they they've they've fought with a uh, kraken or something up there and <laughs> i seriously so i we just we gave up man we wussed out we did not make it up far at all so congratulations to you for tackling that beast as often as you have i'm very impressed thank you yeah I'd, i got to get back out there and see where i'd be at today cuz this, this dates back probably seven or eight years ago that I did it regularly. But yeah, that's, that mountain is different than most because 
you're kind of um, it's a it's more of a quad workout than a calf workout because you're you're stepping on these giant boulders versus like just a, a trail or a path. Uh huh. So yeah. Well, I got to be honest with you. I'm just going to take your word for it on the boulders because I don't think we made it up far enough. We were still on the trail. <laughs> so oh, we you were didn't on even the, get... it, Yeah, it starts yeah. off with a trail and like some uh -huh. railroad ties that are more like stairs. And then, yeah, then you get into the real hike. So, <laughs> Oh, my. Have you done it in the summertime when it's like 115 degrees there in Phoenix? Uh, yeah, but when we do that, it's usually like 4 a.m. with headlamps on. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so you grew up in Phoenix and you have a sister that's pretty close in age, just two years older than you. Um, Heather, were you yep. guys close? Um, how, how was your childhood growing up with a sibling? We were not close as kids. In, in fact, we didn't even like each other very much, I don't think. Um, <laughs> but, but as adults, we're very close. Uh, so luckily... That's good. Yeah, you know, we got all those things worked out, but yeah, she was, you know, she was close enough in age that I think I had a lot of envy that she got to do things that I couldn't do, stay out later with her friends, you know, things mm. like that. And so I kind of held that against her versus my parents. I got you. Well, you eventually ended up going to college at Northern Arizona University up in Flagstaff. Uh, first of all, Flagstaff, I have never spent time in that town, but I have wanted to so badly. I've driven through. It just seems like it's the escape from the desert living down in Phoenix. You get up there to the cool air, to the snow, to the trees. I mean, it's a completely different world up there, is it not? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem like Phoenix at all. Unfortunately, in my, my college years, I didn't you know stop to appreciate that. You know, I, I was happy to be out of the heat, but as far as the the snow and the, the forest and the beautiful things you could see there. I, I was more just interested in typical college, uh, you know, partying. <laughs> well, what did you go to? Did you go to college with a particular field of study in mind or were you just going to college? <laughs> I did. Um, I was taking some psychology courses and primarily I, I wanted that to turn into like animal behaviorism stuff because uh, ideally uh -huh. I wanted to be an animal trainer, um, okay. uh, particularly a dolphin trainer, uh, which was, was a dream of mine from childhood that I, I had kind of set my mind on and even up through college uh, didn't really allow myself the grace to to let go of, of that. Um <laughs> So, so yeah, that's, I was, I was yeah. primarily taking psychology courses. Um, but honestly, at that point, my, my main goals were not even education. It was, I was up there for the social life. Right. Okay. And there's a lot here that I want to explore off of that. You stayed up there at NAU for one year. What made you just stop going? Uh, I, I was really, I wasn't attending classes. I was, <laughs> that'll I was, do it. Yeah. I was not a good student and my parents were footing the bill and, uh, uh you know, they said, you're either going to get good grades or you're going to come home. And so I, I enjoyed the year that I was there and then I came home. Okay. You, you mentioned wanting to be a dolphin trainer. How does one growing up in the Grand Canyon state ever get interested in possibly training dolphins for a career? You know, I, I don't remember the origin of, of that dream other than we used to go to SeaWorld once a year as a family. And it was kind of a it was a tradition that we the whole family enjoyed. And uh, when I was really young, my parents uh, paid for the like meet a dolphin excursion. And cool. uh, so we got to get get in the water with one. And I don't know, I just just fell in love and thought it thought it was what I was destined to become. Funny story, uh, Josh, the customer service manager over here at where I work at the Fantasy Footballers podcast and the Spitballers podcast, he uh, he was actually a dolphin trainer for several years. So I, I didn't find that out until later after I had known Josh. Oh, for a while. if you but had he, only met him sooner, huh? <laughs> I guess, yeah. But it's right. it's funny to to find somebody else that not only had that dream but actually you know pursued it. That's really cool because there can't be that many in the profession. I wouldn't think. <laughs> right. So. You mentioned there the Fantasy Footballers podcast, the one that I, I think you work on both shows. I'm sure they have you guys working on both, but correct me if I'm wrong. You're the executive producer of the Spitballers podcast, but yet you still do stuff with Fantasy Footballers. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been uh, titled the executive producer, but I like what you did there and I'm hoping it yeah. sticks. <laughs> yeah. I gave Around that here. to you. You tell the yeah, guys yeah. that you are now the executive producer of the Spitballers, the award-winning Spitballers comedy podcast. Okay. That's right. Yep. Best in comedy two years in a row. I, I, I love you guys show. I love what you do. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, it's a fun 
little reprieve. It, it's one of those that you can just kind of turn the mics on and, and spitball, and it doesn't take a lot of prep, like, you know, our Fantasy Footballers podcast. Right. You know, there's a lot of analytics and prep and stuff that goes into that. Spitballers, well, you know, we have to have a rough outline, but if, if things go wild, that's even better. It is the only podcast that I am a member of through Patreon of the Spitballers Comedy Podcast. So worth it, you guys. And one of these days, I'm going to take advantage of that uh, membership and send you some ideas for the show. Because what you do, and correct me if I'm wrong, just as a listener of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, it just kind of organically happened that Spitballers spun off of that, right? With the guys would just nonsensically talk about stuff that wasn't related to fantasy football. And probably, I would just imagine... A light bulb went off one day around the office and you guys decided, hey, let's do another podcast that's not sports related. And the genius that is spitballers came from that. Is that does that sound about right? Yeah, you're pretty spot on there. Um, Yeah, a lot of people would say, hey, we want more of that just banter. Um, But, you know, the show being fantasy football focused. Yeah. You know, it's okay to have some of that in there. And it's actually, you know. I think it's what sets that show apart is it's not mundane and boring, but you, you still have to have your focus uh, on fantasy football. So for a while, the guys did a show, uh, what they called the show after the show, uh, which was, you know, five or 10 minutes of a certain topic where they would just kind of banter about stuff. And then that kind of went away and people kind of demanded it back. And that's when <laughs> I think Spitballers, the idea for that was born. And it just turned into a reprieve, I think, for them, just a, an opportunity to come and, like I said, flip the mics on and just be stupid. And um, yeah, it was just kind of born out of a, a little passion project for podcasting and and just being silly well the guys andy mike and jason they're just naturals and they're naturals in each other's presence and it's it's just such a refreshing podcast to listen to when you want to laugh you as the executive producer which we have determined uh through this podcast (laughs) uh i i don't know how much structure goes through you like are you the one that sets up the outline of the show And what I'm getting at is I always look forward to the two truths, one lie segment where you stump the guys with three facts, two two are facts, and one is just made up, but they all are believable, and you constantly stump them. And to this date, has anybody gotten three in a row right, or is that still... Nope, uh, nope. So far, so far, I I, uh, reign king of the castle in that. Yeah, you're you're undefeated. (laughs) Yep. So yeah, I do all the the show prep for that show. Um, I I make the show doc, I find the, you know, would you rather questions, the, all, (laughs) all the different segments we do that's all me they don't uh actually see that until literally five minutes before we sit down and start recording and and that's (laughs) kind of intentional because it's it's far better for them to just be winging it than you know preparing for any of these questions so that's Mm -hmm. that's the funniest moments that have happened on that show have come from just this spontaneity that you just can't get if you're prepping so this is interesting in that you mentioned animal psychology earlier Your wife, correct me if I'm wrong, her area of expertise is in the realm of psychology, correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay, so A, how much does that background of not only you but her help in formulating these lies for the guys? Like, how do you go about coming up with these um, traps for Andy, Mike, and Jason on the... Two truths and one lie. Does she help you with that stuff? She does not. No. Um, okay. I, maybe I should enlist her help. I. I don't know. <laughs> I, I. I shouldn't say that. I'll give her a little credit in the sense that if I have several um, that I think are are good, I'll send them to her and say which one of these is more believable to you. But yeah, she doesn't really. Sh- she's busy. She works hard. Right. And you know, so I don't. I don't want to pull her into my work too much. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I'll bounce things off her, and she'll say, "Oh yeah, that's a good one," or whatever. So how do you go about that? Is it just you? randomly reading stuff on the internet um are you just compiling things in your head because you are an excellent liar (laughs) and i'm just wondering how you go about coming up with those um questions those facts yeah i wish i had an answer to that but i (laughs) i mean when it comes to finding the truths you know that's just scouring the internet for you know unbelievable facts or you know stuff like that Uh um but when when it comes to the lies i mean my parents would tell you as a kid they they always told me oh you're gonna be a lawyer when you grow up you're you know 
or uh, you should be on the debate team in high school. Like I could argue anything. I can. <laughs> I, I was a way better liar than I'd like to admit. So uh, maybe that's a skill that I've had for you know for life. Uh, but yeah, no, I just uh, I just. They just kind of pop into my head yeah. as I'm go, going through the truths, and well, and I try to try to dress them up in a way that that might be believable. But yeah, and and you're using your powers for good at least. So that's that's right. That's helpful. So I can't get through this podcast without passing along um, my youngest daughter, who just turned 13, and and I have actually tweeted out pictures before of she will just set up a tablet there at her bedside and just listen to spitballers and it'll just run through all night of her just listening to you guys. She absolutely loves the show. And she wanted me to tell you that her favorite episode is episode 83, not only because it features Disney princesses battling it out to the death, but it also features you, sir, with your inaugural scat that will live forever in spitballers lore. (laughs) <laughs> uh, that's How? awesome that's good to hear. I, I actually i remember you tweeting that picture i mean oh. this probably goes back over a year ago now i would assume right. but yeah I, I distinctly remember seeing that picture on twitter of, of her sleeping in her bed with the spitballers playing next to her so that's <laughs> that's really cool i didn't even realize that was you uh, yeah. or your daughter um right but yeah that that scat uh i i hope i never have to do another one again i'm afraid <laughs> one of these days they're gonna force me to but uh that that was a fun one and 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 twitter ate it up so yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when she found out I was going to be sitting down with you, she said, you got to talk about episode 83. And I'm like, what is episode 83? She goes, look it up. And I looked it up and I said, oh, Disney princesses and stuff. No, no, that wasn't the headliner for her. It was your singing. By the way, we, we don't often hear your name on the show as Jeremy. We hear you referred to as Owl Borland, which I, I think has been explained. Um, and those of us that are old enough used to enjoy the show Home Improvement. And there was a character, Al Borland. He was a very, he was a handyman. You know, he worked on the show with Tim Allen. So you've earned that nickname by just your abilities around the house and around the office, right? Like when, when one of the guys has a, some sort of home improvement issue, they call you. That That is how you got that nickname, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So uh, prior to being employed here, uh, I've been I've been friends with these guys for, for years. And I would come over... They would call me when they needed lights hung in the studio <laughs> or uh, basically any anything that's that uh, involves more than uh, a 3M uh Velcro strip on the wall. So, <laughs> I would be the guy calling you, by the way, because if I try anything like that, I just injure myself immediately. So I would be just like them bugging you to come over. <laughs> Please help me, Jeremy. Well, you got my number, so feel free. <laughs> OK, very good. Uh, so yeah. So how often do they lean on you to fix stuff around the office? Well, now they pay me to do it. So that's even better. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, we're typically, you know, once a week or so, one of their old things that they hung up before I was employed here falls off the wall and then I get to <laughs> fix that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the majority of like the build out of our studio and stuff is done now. So most of that work is done, but we still, you know, constantly run into, improvements we want to do and then they usually turn to me and say hey how do we make this happen or actually it's more like hey make this happen and then i figure that out so right now I, i'm again i'm just imagining here are you the one that's responsible for pushing out the episodes to the world uh, so the people like myself get to enjoy them in a timely manner each day uh for spitballers that is correct yep uh and for the footballers podcast i still do a fair amount of the the post production work audio and video editing um depending on the day brooks and i kind of split those tasks up but then uh brooks uh carmine who, who we haven't mentioned here but he's I guess what we would consider the executive producer of the Fantasy Footballers <laughs> podcast. There you go. <laughs> uh, him and I work pretty closely on on that podcast. That one's grown to a point where it's really a two man job. So, but he's responsible for scheduling and pushing that one out, and I do Spitballers. Gotcha. Yeah, I briefly met him at the live event here in Dallas a couple of years ago. Uh, super nice guy, uh, Brooks. I'm glad you brought him up there. Okay, so. Before you were in this world of podcasting with the guys, what was your background as far as employment? Because, you know, podcasting has really only taken off in the last, I don't know, maybe five, six years here. What was your life like before that? Uh, Well, primarily, 
I, I mean, I had some odd jobs, you know, as, as a high school student and, and just out of, you know, after my one year of college where I had no education and I, I did some some odd jobs here and there. But my main career was I was the production manager for a custom signage company here in the Valley. We did a lot. I mean, all the signs at the airport and hotels and any big oh, wow. high end signage. We, we did that. So we're yeah, all, all kinds of production of custom signage. I did that for, I started there as like an installer. Again, that's, that's probably where I picked up most of my, uh, my handyman skills, but mm-hmm. my, my father worked for the company as a salesperson for, you know, 20 years before I started working there. And I was, like I said, fresh out of one year of college with no education. So he said, Hey, come, come work for me. So I wasn't really working for him, but I was working for that company. Sure. And I did I, I did you. install of these signs for a few years before I started kind of moving my way up through the company uh, mm-hmm. into it came into the factory for production and did ran some CNC machinery and, and stuff like that for a couple of years until eventually becoming one of the production managers there. Overall, I was employed there for about 15 years uh, before leaving there to come here. So how big are the signs? The signs were, they ranged from anything from literally uh, a plaque next to your hotel room door that says room 152 to oh. giant um, freeway, what we call LED reader boards or those, you know, the signage you see that that is dynamic, that changes advertisements or whatever. Anything from 90 foot tall freeway signs to a little plaque next to your door. How big is the workspace for all of the production of these signs at the same time? I couldn't tell you in square footage, to be honest. It was <laughs> it was a big you know, warehouse factory. Um, but yeah, and then obviously we had a huge lot that we were on too, so we could store a lot of stuff outside because, you know, to install these things, you have to have multiple crane trucks and, and Goodness. you know, service yeah. vehicles and stuff like that. So it was a it was a big facility, but I I I don't know as far as actual Understood. square footage. Sure. So you're married to Rachel and we kind of hinted at this earlier. She's a doctor of clinical psychology. I wonder does she ever does she ever stop and analyze you on the fly or oh, on, how, <laughs> on the daily, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that that must be an interesting dynamic there. Uh, y'all have a son who's five years old, Sawyer. Tell us about him. Uh, he's awesome. and it, it, There's a reason we only have one kid, uh, and that's because we kind of hit it out of the park on the first one, and we were afraid that to go to go back to the well on that. So that's a good answer. Th- <laughs> yeah, he's he's an awesome kid. He's yeah, he's five years old. I, I don't know what to say about him other than he's just, he's perfect. That's really cool. That's great. That's great. I, I'll tell you one thing that I got away from doing. I've got three children. The older they get, they get involved with activities. They have friends. They have commitments that are separate from you. But one thing I did, especially when they were around that age, five years old, like Sawyer, is that I would take uh, one of them out every Saturday morning, whether we go to McDonald's for breakfast or go shopping, you know, whatever we had going on. It was just a daddy-daughter date or a daddy-son date where I just got one-on-one time with my kids because it's it's really valuable to have those one-on-one interactions with them. And one of my good friends, he just has the one daughter, and he talks about how they hang out and it's just the two of them And so that, that, yes, I'm an only child and I wish that I had had siblings growing up, but I can tell you from the other perspective now, as an adult, as a parent, that one-on-one time with your children is invaluable. So good for you. And I love that answer. You just did such a great job with Sawyer. He's so awesome that you don't need any more kids. Yeah. I mean, I wish I could say we did such a great job. I really think we just got lucky, but (laughs) either way, either way, he's, he's awesome. That's cool. So... I mean, you, you're obviously a handyman, but you're also an outdoor type guy because you talked about, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to call it, you bragged about uh, going up and down <laughs> camelback. No, um, but you, you like being outdoors, right? I mean, that that's something you really enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, mountain biking was a huge passion of mine um, prior to having a kiddo. Uh, not doing it as much these days, but yeah. trying, well, to, get, trying to balance. He'll get to that age. I don't know how old you are, but he'll get to that age where he can join you uh, and you can get back into those hobbies like mountain biking because he'll be able to do it with you. Yeah. Yeah. And we're already getting, I mean, I'm uh, 37 just to answer that. Um, okay. But he's already getting to a point where like it used to be if we if I wanted to hike, I had to put him in a backpack and, you know, my hike just got infinitely more <laughs> difficult. Um, but yeah. just recently, I mean, week like two weeks ago, we were in Flagstaff for just a little uh, staycation for the weekend. And we were able to do this really cool. You hike back about a half mile and then 
you get to the opening of what they call these lava tubes, which is essentially just this underground cave that you can walk in for about three quarters of a mile in and then three quarters of a mile back. And it's all, you know, pitch black, underground, freezing cold. And he was able to do all that. And I was really impressed at five years old that I didn't ever have to pick him up. And he, he, so he's really starting to blossom into a kid that loves some of this outdoor stuff, too. So hiking and camping and kayaking, those are all things I can do with him now. Um, mountain bike riding that's might cool. have to wait for a little bit because that's pretty extreme. But <laughs> So you are a musician as well. I, I really I don't know that there's anything you can't do, um, honestly. Uh Dolphin training may be the last on your list of things to accomplish, but I see where you have been a pit musician for a musical theater playing the bass guitar, and I don't know what a digital trumpet is, but tell us about that instrument. What is that? Yeah, so I, I'm pretty sure they've been discontinued, so I don't even huh. know that you can get them. I could be wrong, but it, the instrument's called a Morrison digital trumpet or an MDT, uh, and essentially it looks like a plastic trumpet, um, but... And it's got the three valves on the top of it like a normal trumpet would. But it runs through like a synthesizer uh, and you still blow into it. You don't, without getting too nerdy about trumpet talk, uh, <laughs> you, you don't buzz into it like you would a normal trumpet. You you more blow into it like you would into a straw. Um, okay. But the harder you blow, the louder it is. So you still have like a really expressive dynamics. And But then you, you can, you know, cue up in your synth. Uh, I want to sound like a flute. So for musical theater and as a pit musician, it was a really versatile instrument because if the music director of a particular show didn't have a flute player, couldn't find a good flute player for this part or a violinist or a cellist or whatever. I could read the the cello book and just put, you know, make my instrument sound like a cello and I would be playing huh. the cello part. So that it, it's a really fun instrument. Uh, you can, it's super versatile. You can make it sound like an electric guitar or anything you want. That is cool. That is really cool. So when you're in the pit for these musicals, how, Okay, I, I, I'm sorry. I just, I've never been in a pit. You obviously can't see what's going on on the stage, correct? It's down too far. Is that accurate? Uh, in most spaces that I've worked in, uh, there's a monitor. So yeah, you can't, you can't see it live, but you've got a TV monitor there so you can see. You okay. Because okay. a lot of times you're taking a cue off an actor's position or a hand right. gesture or okay. something. So you do need to see some of those things. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Is it, are you basing what is next to be played on what's happening on stage or is there a director down there with you and number two or a conductor i don't know the the technical term and isn't it so pitch dark down there i mean maybe you have the little the little lights on your um the sheet holder on the music stand yeah <laughs> music yeah. stand thank you a complicated term for my brain but i just wonder yeah. <laughs> what is it like down there i mean are people running into each other and stuff or how's what's going no, on down it's, there it's pretty it's pretty docile like it, you're okay. just sitting in a chair in a dark room and yeah and <laughs> back in the day you'd have a light on your music stand these days almost everybody has an ipad with their sheet music on it so um oh. and then you just you have a little bluetooth pedal that allows you to flip the page when you need to which is whoa you know, it, it's it's a <laughs> high-tech solution to a, a you know not even a real problem but back in the day you'd have to turn your own pages and now you you just push a foot pedal but uh you do huh. have a, a conductor down there as well that depending on the setup will sometimes have their head kind of above stage level so they can actually see what's going on i see um but that's not always the case. And honestly, the shows that I preferred the most are I really enjoyed like contemporary Broadway musicals. So and a lot of times with those ones, it's more of a rock band setting and the band will actually be on stage off to the side, um, visible to the audience. So those were the I like being able to you know have some stage presence and, and kind of mm -hmm. dance like an idiot during the during the music. <laughs> so those were the ones that I enjoyed the most. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of times you're just sitting down there in a dark room and uh, watching the actors on screen. You mentioned contemporary musicals, and the first thing that comes to mind for me, and probably many, is Hamilton. And you mentioned that soundtrack is one of your favorites, at least currently. I will say that my daughters especially are constantly singing tunes from that play, and I loved Hamilton. I I'm, a I'm a history buff, and I went into it thinking, okay, I guess I'll finally watch this and it's probably, you know, terrible and they probably misrepresent a bunch of stuff. I thought it was so well done and it's so addictive. Uh, there are so many quotable moments from that show and it's just it's a treat that that my kids are quoting history and but for them it's just entertainment. So 
that's obviously a favorite of yours, correct? Yeah, yeah, that one, it's great. Anything, I, uh, Lin-Manuel, who obviously wrote that show, also did a show called In the Heights that I, that I had kind of fallen in love with prior to Hamilton. And mm. so I was already a big fan of Lin-Manuel and his style. And yeah, Hamilton was an awesome fusion of history. And, and I, I just love it because it, it gets people like yourself who might not be super into theater. Mm-hmm. But you might be into history or you might be into that style of music um, as opposed to, you know, just anything that's operatic and boring. Uh, so it really <laughs> kind of bridged the gap for yes for people that aren't into theater. And uh, I've always been an, like telling people like theater doesn't have to be like boring and um, just these operas that drone on. Like there's a lot of really good theater out there that is compelling, that makes you know thought provoking and entertaining. And, it you know far better than watching a movie in my opinion so i really enjoyed seeing people that that don't normally give theatrical productions the time of day uh Mm -hmm. start to fall in love with that we were fortunate in the sense that we were on tour with the fantasy footballers i guess last summer or two summers ago now Uh, i've eliminated 2020 from my head so it would have been (laughs) summer of 2019 we were on tour and we got stuck in chicago uh because our plane flights were canceled and they couldn't get us out for like days so we were we were stuck there for multiple days and we ended up all going to see a a live production of hamilton which until then i had only seen bootleg versions of it or listened to the soundtrack (laughs) so it was awesome being able to actually see a live production of it finally right and you're so right about how the history buffs that weren't into theater got drawn in and the theater buffs that weren't into history got drawn in it is truly a, a great combination and i'm so grateful that disney plus made that available for people like me who had no interest in spending 500 bucks a ticket to go and see it on Broadway. Exactly. So, yep. And so, honestly, uh, you got a better seat than anybody that did spend 500 bucks on it because that production right. that they did on Disney Plus, I mean, you 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 know, when you seeing it live is great and nothing I would never take away from that, but you you don't get the same kind of, you know, view of the actors' faces and emotion and stuff. So, it mm-hmm. it is cool to see see those uh, really well produced live production recordings. Absolutely. Now, obviously, you're a big music fan, and I'm going to show how dumb I am. I was reading through your answer where you said that you had a lot of sea shanties in your playlist lately. And so I thought that's a cool name for a band. So I went to Spotify before this interview, and I was looking for the band uh, Sea Shanties. (laughs) And uh, I was quickly educated, and I confirmed with someone else that, no, no, dummy, uh, that's, that's a style of music sea shanties and i I just always called them like uh maritime limericks or something like that but you know it's it's kind of that ocean feel and again i may be only explaining this to myself everybody else might be rolling their eyes thinking what an idiot keith is wouldn't be the first time but um there once was a man who lived by i don't know and anyway so I've never seen that answer. I've never seen a reference to it. How does a guy who grew up in the desert for all intents and purposes get into sea shanty music? Uh, honestly, I mean, I've, I've <laughs> enjoyed it for a long time, but it's been in my playlist lately because there was like this viral TikTok uh, video of, okay. of these these men doing this acapella sea shanty that was just incredible. And it, it kind of reignited my, my enjoyment of that music. Uh, it's... It's nothing. It's funny because it's not like instrumentally and stuff. It's not like this super complex music that, you know, I can appreciate from a musician's perspective. The harmonies are really good vocally, but it's more of just like something you can just tune on. And I just have a hard time listening to it and not smiling. It's just these, (laughs) you know, it's like pirate music. And yeah, there you go. Pirate music. (laughs) Sounds like, yeah, pirate music mixed with like Irish pub music. Um, Uh huh. Uh, so, and, and I've always enjoyed a good, like Scottish or Irish accent. So yeah, I, they've no, just found their way into my playlists. Recently. <laughs> that's fun. You can literally find anything on Spotify. That's so great. So, oh yeah, you enjoy reading. Maybe you don't get to read as much as you would like to, but tell us about the book. I was intrigued by this. It sounds pretty good. Uh, love does by Bob Goff. Tell us about that book. Yeah, it's. It's just a really good book that was recommended to me by a close friend that uh, it just focuses on like uh, being present and being intentional, finding extraordinary things in the ordinary and just really loving people well, essentially, is the is the hmm. main focus of the book. And it just helped me grow as like 
as a husband and as a father uh, to be more in, intentional about the way I love my family. Uh, so, yeah, it's a it's a great book. Uh, Bob tells a lot of stories of himself in his younger years. Uh, one example that's popping into my head that really doesn't have to do with love, but that was a fascinating story was that he um, like didn't have good enough grades to get into the college he wanted to. So every day he went and sat outside the dean's office or the, you know, whoever's in charge of admitting um, and sat there and a- asked to get into the college every day. He did that until he was finally accepted into this college that he wanted. Um, <laughs> But he, he just tells all these little anecdotes and stories that really make you kind of think and, like I said, find some of the extraordinary and the ordinary. So I highly recommend it. It, it, yeah. it does have a very Christian and biblical perspective to it. So be forewarned there if, if that's not your thing. But mm-hmm. they're good principles that I think, you know, anybody can you know, can take away some good stuff from there. Another thing that you try to get into along those lines is the Bible are you trying to read it from start to finish or just or just spend time with it every day? I mean, ultimately, the goal is just to spend some time in it every day. And I admit that I am not always great about that. Um, sure. But that is the goal. And yeah, currently I am going through, you know, we uh, started here in the office. We have a, a group of uh, like-minded individuals that this year at the start of 21, we started a reading plan that is essentially the goal is to get all the way through it, not necessarily chronal, or in in like front to back. Uh, it, the plan kind of <laughs> jumps you around a little bit more uh, chronologically in a, in a way that's kind of easier to understand what's going on um, because that's cool. the Bible is a very difficult book to uh, understand all the time. So anyway, that that's our goal. No, absolutely. I, I, I understand. So will you know when you're done with it? When, you know, when you have made it all the way through, like I could understand from start to finish, it would be obvious, you know, when you get done with Revelation, you're fine. You know, you got to the end. Whereas if it's, if it's spread out, I just hope that you, you know, when you've covered all the ground. Yeah, we've got it all, the plans all laid okay, out. You got It'll it mapped take out. Us okay. all the way through 2021. So we'll be finished at the end of the, the new year, or I'm sorry, well, that's at good, the end of man. the year. Um, I hope that, but yeah, yeah, we, and there's some accountability built in. We have a, a spreadsheet that every day you have to check off if you did your reading and I got you. you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling to keep up with everybody else. Um, but, <laughs> okay. But, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Okay. So I ask people what their favorite app is. You listed YouTube. I know Twitter. I know Slack. I know I, I don't use it, but I know what its purpose is. Um, actually, actually, uh, my fantasy football league, I've been the commissioner of a league since 1999, and most of the guys who were in it originally are, are still a part of it. And we actually used Slack for a while until we started using what you guys recommended, the Sleeper app, and then it's got the message board built in. But after your recommendation of Slack, I see three apps that I am not familiar with at all. Obviously, I'm familiar with Reddit. I don't know what Norwal is, and I don't know what Webull is. And I don't know what auto sleep is, but I'm really interested in auto sleep because I never have enough of that. Will this, will that sleep for me? What, what is an auto sleep app? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. You just download the app and you never have to rest again. <laughs> it's great. Now it, uh-huh. auto sleep is, it, it's a sleep tracker. It's uh, I, I wear my Apple watch to bed um, ah, Okay. And, and everybody says, Oh, how do you use your watch during the day? If you, you know, sleep with it on, but I just I usually put my watch on the charger at like dinner time and then by bed it's charged up. So uh, and that's I have uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea. So it, it allows me to really kind of see when my sleep is good and I'm getting good, restful, deep sleep. And when, you know, it, it monitors things like your heart rate during sleep and your oxygen saturation and things like that. So it's just one of those things that every morning I just kind of open it up and see how my sleep was that night and if it was bad, I try and determine, you know, what I did the night before, the day before that might have made it worse. And OK, you know, just trying to help myself get the best rest possible since my rest is fairly poor as it is. OK, that's what I was going to ask you. How do you take that data and apply it? But now I now I see what is Weeble? What is that app? Weeble is similar to Robin Hood, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about oh, lately. Yeah, um, yeah <laughs> okay. it's it's just a stock investing app. We, yep. you know, I, I enjoy uh, dabbling in the stock market, not not as much as the insane gambling that's been going on in the stock market lately, but more from an investment standpoint. Yeah, long that's term. something that, yeah, I've started messing with too. I'm with you. 
And is Narwhal, is that something specific on Reddit that I'm just not familiar with? It's just a, a Reddit client. So, I mean, it's it's literally just a different way of looking at Reddit. To me, it's okay. structured oh, a little bit. The, the UI is just a little bit better than the Reddit native app. So, it, but essentially, it's just Reddit. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, five possessions. If you could only keep five things. And I do love this. Um, your son's stuffed monkey makes the list. How selfless of you to save your son's favorite toy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got a stuffed Curious George that he's been clinging to since before he was one years old. And if that thing somehow got lost or uh, <laughs> you know anything ever happened to it, I, I don't know what would happen. So right, <laughs> but it wouldn't right. be That's, good. I can tell you that. Yeah, uh-huh. um, you listed Chipotle as your favorite comfort food. From listening to the fantasy footballers and the spitballers. It sounds like a lot of stories are based around your, and maybe it's just in my head, it seems like you guys spend a lot of time at Chipotle. Is that accurate? It is quite accurate, yes. (laughs) That that, that is not, we're not sponsored by them. That's not something that we're just saying. Uh, that, That is a place that we spend a fair amount of time right before we spend a fair amount of time in the bathroom. Okay. How did you meet the guys? Um... How did you meet the the crew there, Andy, Mike, Jason, Brooks, all those associated with the fantasy footballers and the spitballers? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Mike and I have been friends uh, since childhood. Um, I, I initially was friends with uh, Mike's cousins. At, uh, he has two cousins that I was fr- that went to my school and I had become friends with, uh, and then eventually I became closer to Mike uh, through church. Uh, His dad was a pastor of our church and we were both in a a performance, a musical performance group that kind of toured around. Um, Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Mike and I have been friends since probably like the junior high age. Then one day he called me and said, hey, I'm on this adult flag football team with some guys at work. He at the time was was doing video game music production Mm -hmm. um, and working with Jason and Andy. And he called and said, hey, we got an open spot on this flag football team. We could use somebody else. So I, I came in and we we were playing flag football for a few years together. And that's that's where I met Jason and Andy and grew close to them through that. And then that, you know, around that time is when they started at least talking about maybe trying to do this fantasy football podcast. We were in a <laughs> fantasy football league together at that time. And they, they started this podcast that was really just for the 12 people in our league. Right. Um, and, and they would get on every week and kind of talk about what trades were made and, and, you know, just troll people that did, made poor trade decisions or, or <laughs> lost in a, That's in a me. bad beat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I usually come out on the short end of trades too, but uh-huh. so yeah, it was really just an internally facing podcast that they were having fun with. And at that time it was just Mike and Andy. And then, yeah, I, I, I don't want to, if the whole story isn't, isn't too engaging for you or your audience uh, or already known, but they eventually turned that forward facing to the public. And then when they did that, I was alongside them just helping in a a non-employee capacity, just uh, helping with some production stuff. I was working at the, uh, the sign shop at the time. So I would make them stickers that they could sell to people for their cars and, and things like that. And eventually when it grew big enough, they, they gave me a call and hired me on. That's really cool. Uh, You mentioned flag football, so we, we've heard referenced every now and then. Tell us, how good of a quarterback is Andy Holloway? Uh, oh, man, that, he's good. He's good. I don't want to. I don't want to say he had he had his moments where you would yeah. you would qu- question it, um, but he would also he, he was very like uh, up and down. So he'd have his games where you'd think he was the best in the world, and he'd throw you know six touchdowns, and then literally the very next week he'd come out and throw six interceptions for zero touchdowns. So, but okay, it, he's far better than I could ever be. So at, at that position. Sounds like the Jared Goff of flag football quarterbacks. That's right. That's so, right. <laughs> um, I like this. If you could go back in history, you'd want to meet Alexander Hamilton just to see how he compares with the uh, smash musical Alexander yeah. Hamilton. <laughs> That's a good answer. Yeah, I mean, I like I, uh, honestly, I, I, I'm not a history buff. Like you said before, that the musical helped bridge the uh, the gap in the sense that people that are musical fans but not history buffs, like – kind of got it got some history uh, uh subconsciously or whatever but uh it, it actually did make me really kind of wonder what 
he was like as a, in real life. You know, the musical's great, but I am sure some liberties were taken. I'm sure there was some dramatization of that. And I, I would love to meet him and just see how he compares to the to the Hamilton I now know sure. through the musical. Yeah. So you grew up in Arizona, but you became a Packers fan. And let me just jump in there and just let you know that I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a fan of the forever cursed Atlanta Falcons. And I'm just wondering how you became a Packers fan when you had a local team, because all the guys on the show are Cardinals fans. What happened to you? How did you end up with the Packers? Yeah, I grew up a 49ers fan um, oh. just because when I was a kid, my neighbors uh, that I was really good friends with, they were all 49ers fans. So by proxy, I was too. It was in the you know Joe Montana, Jerry Rice era. So it was easy to be a 49ers fan. Um, uh-huh. Then I kind of... Honestly, I kind of fell away from football for a while and, and just really wasn't into it uh, until I met my wife and her whole family is from Green Bay. And we started going back to Green Bay and they have uh, season tickets at Lambeau. And so we would go to Packer games and it just kind of reignited my my passion for football. And, and that's where the, the well, Packers fandom came out. Well, as a Falcons fan with very few moments of glory, allow me to take the opportunity to say that the First ever team to defeat the Packers at Lambeau. And it was snowing that night was the Atlanta Falcons. So that's all that's all I'll say. But I mean, you guys have had had our number plenty of times <laughs> since. So let's just leave it right there. So do you still have a soft spot for the 49ers or is that completely gone? That's completely gone. It really was okay. is more just uh, uh, my friends I liked them. So I liked them, yeah. too. <laughs> OK. Um, I love this. I ask on the email that I send, what's your earliest memory? And you said, I have a notoriously bad memory. My earliest memory is probably as an adult. I'm with you, man. (laughs) I'm with you as far as I cannot remember anything. My life is, and this is no joke, it's just a series of post-it notes that I write throughout the course of a day. And when I get through all of them, then I know my day is over or, or they're, they're shoved into my pockets. And if I, if it's something I have to do at home or something like that. So I'm with you on that stuff. In fact, the, the movie Memento is written after my heart. If you're not familiar with it, you might appreciate that. But um, you, you truly don't have a really early childhood memory, huh? Not really, to be honest. Yeah, it's funny. My family, I'm sure, will probably listen to this podcast and and laugh because they all constantly tease me about it. Um, Or even around the office, Mike, you know, like I said, we've been friends since childhood. He'll bring up stuff. Oh, remember this? And No, I don't remember that at all. Uh, (laughs) I'm sure it was fun. Now, you you mentioned those that have had a big impact on you. You talk about your dad's work ethic and your mom supporting you through anything that you do. Tell us about them. Yeah. So my dad has always had a really strong work ethic. Like I said, he he brought me on board at the signage shop that he was at. Um, but he worked there. I think he worked there when I was born, if I'm not mistaken. And he worked there all the way up through my adult life. And he still works there after he took like a three year hiatus to he bought a business and ran that for three years and then sold that and went back to working where he, he was. But he's always just had a super strong work ethic. And he really instilled that in me uh, as a as a child. Um, and I just really appreciated that, especially, you know, the more now that I'm getting older and see some of the younger population just really not want to work. Um, it makes me appreciate that, uh, you know, work ethic that he instilled in me. Uh, but he also was, I, I, you know, I, I put on there that my mother supported through anything, but he was also, I mean, he was my Boy Scout leader growing up. He was at every choir cool. concert and every band performance. So even though he had a super strong work ethic and was probably putting in 50, 60 hour weeks most of the time, he was always still present. And and yeah, my mom, she was the same way. She Anything she could get involved in that, you know, allowed a parent support, she was there. So yeah, my, I, I got an That's awesome great. set of parents that I'm very blessed with. Yeah, it sounds like it. Now, I don't want it to go to their heads, but you list the fantasy footballers, the guys with the show, Andy, Mike, and Jason, as those that have had a big impact on you. How so? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> honestly, it, you know, the this the fantasy footballers and, you know, this company um, <clears throat> is, goes far beyond just fantasy football and comedy. Like, it really has become a very close-knit group of, of like-minded individuals that – we're, that support each other, that are there for each other through everything. When things are hard, you know, th- they're, they're some of the first people I turn to when, when things get rough. So, and then, um, yeah, it, all three of them have, have kind of poured into me in, in some sort of mentorship type way in one way or another. Hmm. 
whether it be spiritually or or they're they're all great fathers and so there's there's it some, seems like it it, it seems yeah. like everybody associated with the podcasts um are all 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 of you guys behind the scenes or in front of the camera all seem like genuinely great guys and and i'm glad to hear that yeah and when you surround yourself with people that think the same way or that people you aspire to be like, you know, you you can't help but become more of that, more like that. And so mm-hmm. when I say they had a big impact on me, yeah, they just being around them and, and um, yeah, surrounding myself with that has has helped me become a better husband, better father, you know, better employee. And it's it's an awesome, awesome place to work. Yeah. And, and you took a really big gamble because uh, you gave up a, a really high paying job with the sign company to start working with the guys at the podcast. That's obviously paid off. Yeah. Yeah. That was a really hard decision to be honest, even though, I mean, most people listening to this, if they're familiar with the show would probably go, how hard of a decision is it to go work for the fantasy footballers? You know, if you're offered a job, but yeah, I was, I was making good money. Um, I was working a lot and I was very stressed, but I was making good money. My wife at the time we had just had our son, um, and so she was kind of struggling. She's a psychologist. So if she was to work full time, you know, she also has some good income uh, opportunity. But she, at that time, she was struggling because she, we had just had a child. She worked uh, or she you know, took her maternity leave and then she went back to work full time and really just wanted to be present with our, our son. So ironically, I was looking to leave my current place of employment just because of the stress and the hours. Sure. But she at the same time was like, I don't know if I want to work. I don't know if, you know, if I do work, I definitely don't want it to be full time. Uh, So, and all this was going on at the same time. And I had kind of, one day I was sitting in the studio with the guys. uh, Again, this goes before I was employed here and we were just sitting around talking and I said, yeah, I think I've made the decision to leave my current job. And they said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I really don't know. I have no idea. I just need something that, you know, I can make good money at and um, allows me more time with my family, more time with my new kid. And probably uh, uh, two weeks later, my wife made the decision to, to officially go part time with her job. So that, as you could imagine, that cut her pay in half. Um, mm-hmm. And and then the guys reached out to me and they said, hey, we, we can check one of those boxes. We can give you a job. It's not going to be high paying, but it, it is going to... Um, you know, allow you some more time with your family and, and your son. And so it, it really was a tough decision to, to half yeah. her income. And at the time, you know, it was like a third of what I was making at, at my job. So it, I think it probably took two or three weeks for me to get back to them after really, you know, talking about it with my wife and praying about it and, and just right. deciding what we wanted to do. And yeah, ultimately we, we made the leap and I have not regretted it once. Uh, it, it was one of the best decisions that completely, I think, changed the trajectory of my life and right. um, our uh, the dynamic in our household when it comes to having a dad that's not stressed and, and working all the time. So that's that's an immeasurable, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really great. Now, speaking of your wife, you obviously listed her as someone who's made a big impact on your life for obvious reasons, but you dated. Then you broke up. Thankfully, you ended up back with each other. But um, how did you guys almost screw that up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, it, and I, you shouldn't even say how did you guys almost screw that up because it was really me. I'll take, I'll, I'll shoulder, <laughs> I'll shoulder the load on that one. I, I was ultimately at, at the beginning of our relationship. I was a toxic boyfriend, if you will. I was very jealous, very controlling. We we met in doing theater. Um, we both were performers and we met in a show and hit it off and started dating, dated for several years. Um, but again, like I said, jealousy and controlling that, that doesn't really go well when your wife is a performer that, or I'm sorry, your girlfriend is a performer that, uh, you know, might be in love scenes with other, other guys or have to kiss somebody else. Uh, and so those kind of, those issues, I allowed them to kind of creep in and, it, it was just really toxic in our relationship. So we we did after, again, my memory is terrible. She'd probably give you a completely different number. But I think it was three or four years into dating exclusively that she decided that it was just too toxic for her. And so we did break up. We both moved on and, and dated other people mm. um, for probably about a year and a half, I think, two years, something like that. And then eventually uh, we ran into each other again because... 
being still both doing theater and, and running in the same circles, there was just a lot of crossover in our friends. And so mm -hmm. we ended up running into each other and started talking again and, and decided to give it another go. And yeah, we, we almost really screwed things up. But fortunately, uh, you know, we found our way back to each other. And that was one of the greatest decisions that either of us. That's ever cool. Made. I'm glad that it worked out the way it did. Tell us about your embarrassing moment when you were in fifth grade at a choir concert. Oh, man. I was hoping that one wouldn't come up. <laughs> oh, no. But, you want uh, me to skip that? I can skip that. No, no. It's all good. It, it's just... So, all right. So I was in choir in fifth grade, and um, we... Our, our school auditorium wasn't big enough to handle our choir concerts at our, at our elementary school, so we would always do our choir concerts at the local high school. And so we were there... Uh, to do the choir concert and we we're like backstage getting ready to go on and I told the choir teacher that I really had to go to the bathroom uh, <laughs> and she said sorry like we don't have keys to the restroom this isn't our school they only gave us keys to the auditorium or whatever and, and there were some restrooms you know for patrons in the auditorium but I didn't have time to get over there and so I told her I was like I don't know that I'm gonna make it blah 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 and ultimately they said well just get on stage so we they rushed us out on stage and man my parents, I don't know if they still have this video, but I, I would imagine they do because I definitely have seen it. Uh, Give them my I, email if, if you confirm they have the video. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I am, <laughs> I'm on this stage singing and dancing, and uh, all of a sudden I just stop moving, and my face goes completely white and expressionless, and oh. uh, my pants go extremely dark. And Oh, uh, what color were the so, pants? <laughs> and for, fortunately, they were dark pants. So they, Okay, they, all right. Well, that's yeah, good. <laughs> I doubt... I doubt the audience uh, saw that portion, but it was very clear and obvious that I, in the, this mass of people that are singing and dancing, <laughs> I'm in the, the front row just standing there staring expressionless. Uh, and then I, I, what's funny is then all of a sudden I just start dancing again and I just resume where I left off. Um, and All right, and we, you're a true performer. The, I, I guess. Uh, so, <laughs> but I think the most embarrassing part of it, all of it, I was standing next to a girl that I had a crush on at the time. Her name's Jennifer. I'll never forget that. Oh, um, no. And when, when, so the way we kind of filed off stage after the, co uh, the concert was the front row kind of turned to the right and everybody single file walked off the stage. And sh so when we went to walk off the stage, she taps me on the shoulder and says, did you know you were standing in a puddle? And I don't think she even at the time realized she was innocent and just, you know, giving me a warning not to slip or something. But, um, oh. but yeah, I, I, I distinctly remember how just incredibly embarrassing that was. So, and I, oh. and the other memory I have from that is my aunt had come to that concert and, uh, I just, I, for whatever reason, remember her just chewing out the principal afterwards saying, oh, you know, wow. how, how dare you guys put this kid in this situation? But Oh, Luckily, nice. I, I I moved on and and we got through that. But but was, did did the other kids realize what had happened? Uh, well, it, eventually rumors. Yes, I, uh, I think at the time, you know, only one or two people realized it. But it, you, you know, elementary school, it didn't take long yeah, for everybody. Sure, to fifth grade, brutal, right before yep. middle school. Yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, um, and the audience wants to check out uh, a similar story, you were you know roughly ten or eleven years old. If it's fifth grade. Uh, there's a story in episode 42 with my buddy Tank Spencer that will have, um, uh, he has a tale of inappropriate times for P to be present. Say that five times fast. When he was 23 <laughs> years old, he was 23. So you, uh, you're you not the most embarrassing story when it comes to urine. Um, okay. Um, you have a regret and I feel for you. I truly do. You sold your Bitcoin, quote, very early Jeremy, how what was the bit what was the price of Bitcoin when you sold? I gotta know. It was around like thirty to fifty dollars, uh, somewhere in there. Definitely sub one hundred. Yeah. It, Do uh, I know. dare I, ask you how many Bitcoins you had? I I honestly don't know for sure. It was several. Um, I I don't I won't oh, pretend oh, like oh. it was like a a, a oh. whole treasure trunk full, but yeah, it was probably I don't know maybe oh. ten to fifteen Bitcoin. Oh God. Okay. Ah, oh, that's half a million. Okay. All right. I'm going to not dwell yeah, on this. Um, I'm just yeah, going to tell it, you, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. It, it, you know, that, that was back before anybody even knew what Bitcoin was. It was primarily right. used to, uh, yeah, yeah. at the time, I, I think I was um, essentially like pirating TV 
um, you know, like television. Um, and <laughs> the the way to do that was to pay in Bitcoin. So I you oh, know wow. had, had stocked up my Bitcoin wallet so I could pay for my pirated TV channels. Oh wow, I see. Okay, well. So, but then I, uh, you know, I kind of. That, that I was young, and, and eventually I, my conscience got the better of me, and I said, hey, I, I could probably pay a cable bill, so I decided to stop doing that, and at that, I had no no use for these Bitcoin that I had sitting there, so I just converted them back to cash and moved on. You did the right thing, and look what it cost you. <laughs> That's right. No. It lesson, no so, lessons learned. Lessons learned. Yeah. No, I, I don't know when this podcast posts, I don't know what the conclusion will be, but there's a story in the news about the guy who made a Bitcoin educational video. They paid him in Bitcoin. My gosh, I forgot how much, but it's upwards of millions and millions of dollars that it would be worth now. He can't remember his password that he used, and he's got 10 guesses before it locks him out of that Bitcoin forever. He's 0 for 8 at this point and just has two guesses remaining. And... That's and then there's another guy who has millions of dollars of Bitcoin, I think between 20 and 30 million, I think I'm not sure in a landfill on a hard drive in Britain. But the local government won't allow him to go and dig for it in the landfill. And oh, man, gosh. That's so it, it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it could be worse. Right. OK, so I forgot to ask you earlier. I know the character from Home Improvement, Al, A.L. Borland. Is there any particular reason why the guys refer to you as Owl, O-W-L, Borland? Any significance there whatsoever other than just a fun way to pronounce your name? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, nothing we do around <laughs> here has much significance. So let's be clear about that. <laughs> I but, don't care. I love the inside <laughs> jokes on the show, man. Come on. <laughs> it, sure. Uh, yeah. So it was. It actually originated as Al, Al A-L, Borland, um, because okay. obviously my handyman stuff around the office, but I... I made the mistake of wearing a flannel shirt to the office one day. And so I, I legitimately, you know, I'm bearded and um, legitimately probably <laughs> resembled Al Borland a little bit. So that's where that came from. And then one okay. day on the Spitballers, Andy just completely mispronounced it um, and and said, Al Borland is here today. And uh, uh-huh. and Mike kind of razzed him on the show and said, it sounded like you said owl. And, and from then on, that's, that's, that's right. where we okay. got Okay. Yep, yep. Okay. Well, I mean, it could be worse. You could have a different nickname. And after they hear this podcast, you may get one in relation to a choir incident from your <laughs> Maybe. youth. But anyhow, I hope not. I really hope this doesn't, this podcast doesn't get you um, some unflattering uh, remarks from the guys. But uh, uh, they've uh, conditioned I, me well to take a piece <laughs> around here. So that's we'll true. be all right. That's good. Well, it has been a sincere pleasure. Um, thanks for spending time with me. It, it's Jeremy Grantham, and he's on Twitter and Instagram, right? At Producer Borland, B-O-R-L-A-N-D, Producer Borland, on those two social media sites, if you want to check him out. Sincerely, thank you so much, Jeremy, for making time to uh, talk to us here on At The Mic. Absolutely. This was fun. I'm glad you had me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care. All right. It was such a treat for me to get to talk with Jeremy because, quite honestly, perhaps you could tell, I'm a fanboy of the Spitballers and the Fantasy Footballers podcasts, two shows that I really do hope you'll give a listen to if you aren't already familiar with them both. As for this podcast, don't forget that everything you need is located over on atthemikeshow.com where you can find the previous 40-plus conversations that we've had with interesting and entertaining people. Uh, along with ways to connect with the show. And if you would like to offer any feedback or even guest ideas, please feel free. And next time I sit down with someone listeners of Mojo 50 Radio may be familiar with, it's Beth Knott. She and I sit down for a chat about her life story coming up next week. And until next week, I do hope all is well with you. And I thank you again for listening to At The Mic. This has been At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Head to atthemikeshow.com for archived episodes, sponsor information, and ways to connect. Yeah.